Well, welcome to Water of Life. We are so glad that you are joining us for our online experience. And if you don't know me, my name is Victoria and I am your online campus pastor. So I'm here to say hi, to share with you all of the things that are happening at Water of Life. But hey, speaking of things that are happening at Water of Life, if you're new here, we would love to get to know you. So if you can grab your phone and text the word new here to 818 818 where we could learn more about you and share with you all of the things that are happening at Water of Life. And hey, speaking of things that are happening at Water of Life, if you are a part of our online campus, our online community, maybe you live out of town or maybe you've just been watching online over the last year or so, well, we would love to get to know you and we're excited to share that we have our own web page on the website. So make sure you check out wateroflifecc.org slash online where you can find out ways to serve, ways to get connected and so much more. So make sure you check out our new website and we would love to get connected with you. Now, speaking of things happening at Water of Life, we have our new Fall Grow Catalog out today, and we have a digital version available for you. Now, our Grow Catalog is the place where you can find out all of the ministries that are taking place, classes, and so much more. So make sure you click the link, or you can find it on our website today. Now, if you guys are new to Water of Life, or maybe you've been a part of Water of Life for a long time, but you're ready to make that commitment, we would love to invite you to our Discovering Water of Life class, or better wise known as DWALL, happening this weekend on Sunday, directly after our second service. Now, DWALL is the chance for you to learn about the heart of Water of Life, our core values, and so much more. And we're excited to share that Pastor Dan's gonna be teaching this class. So make sure if you wanna do that, you can register online at our website, wateroflifecc.org. And if you know a little bit about our core values, you know that we are about sending. We love and believe that we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And our CityLink Ministries is our local outreach ministry where they go and do just that. They're the hands and feet of Jesus. And they have something called Shower of Blessings that they are launching where they're able to provide uh, showers and so much more for our homeless community. So for our Shower of Blessings, we are collecting things for our hygiene kits from shampoos, conditioners, and so much more. So if you want to turn that in, you can do that at our East Avenue Fontana campus, or you can send those things in if you are not local and you're part of our online campus. You can also send those in to our offices at Miller Avenue. So make sure you check that out. And last but not least, if you know anything about our church, you also know that we have such a big heart for our families. As you can see, we just had our Summer Spectacular this past week where we saw hundreds and hundreds of kids get touched by Jesus. And so if you know anything, you know that we believe in family. We believe in the value of family. And so we're excited to share that all of our kids from infancy all the way up to high school, we are gonna be moving up grades and we call it move up weekend and there's going to be so much taking place so if you have kids um, in elementary school all the way to junior high and high school we would love for you to make sure you check out all of the changes that are happening with move up weekend and if you guys didn't know we have some changes happening in our junior high and high school ministry so if you want to learn more information about that maybe service times for our family ministries or other things you can check that out on our website, wateroflifecc.org. Now we are in week two of our series, The Lessons We Have Learned from Lockdown, and Pastor Dan's gonna be sharing a powerful word. And so we're gonna jump into worship, but if you could do this, if you could just prepare your hearts. I know there's so many things always competing for our attention, but let's just together in prayer say this. Say, Jesus, we are here for you. We're not here for show or to check off on our to-do list. We want to encounter with you today, Jesus. So wherever we're watching from, we just say our hearts are open to experience and encounter your presence today. We love you and we worship you and we give you all the glory and honor and praise and all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, let's jump into the worship center and let's worship together. Good morning, Water of Life. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? It's a new song we're singing if you're online. Thank you for joining us right here in the room. Can you put those hands together? There is joy in the house of the Lord today. Come on. Yeah. We worship the God who was. We worship. 
worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors and he parted the raging seas. My God still holds a victory.
children love you Jesus hear the cry of your children God oh we love you there's no one like you God no one above you Lord heaven and earth may pass away but your word remains Nothing else we can say, God. 
Christ, the solid rock we stand. And all of the ground is sinking sand today. God, we put our trust, our hope, our family, our finances, our health on you, God. Thank you. You're the author, the finisher of our faith. You gave us the example. Let us run after you today. We love you, praise you. Thank you for your presence. There's freedom in it, and we thank you for it. We love you, we praise you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. It's so good to see you here this morning. If you're online, again, we welcome you. Before you're seated in the room, won't you look around, wave to some people, shake their hand, and welcome them to church as we get ready for God's word. Well, how many of you served out there this week? Raise your hand if you served out there. I just want to say way to go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Over 500 of you came out and hung out with the kids this week. That was amazing. It was amazing. And 300 of you went last week and worked in L.A. with One Day L.A. So just want to say way to go. Man, that's, it was awesome. So just a couple of things really quick. Um, we got Discovering Water of Life at 2 o'clock today. After this service, we're serving lunch, and then Pastor Lynn and I will be uh, doing Discovering Water of Life between three and six o'clock tonight. So if you wanna join us and find out about Water of Life, find out just our journey, who we are, what we're doing, and where we're going, you wanna meet some of our staff, we'd love to have you go out after service and sign up out at the um, uh, concourse area. There's some people out there who'll sign you up, and we will get you lunch, and hang out with you for this afternoon. So let's see, just really quick, some pictures here. I wanna show you these pictures. We talked about this last week. Uh, money we've gave in, given away for during COVID. Uh, we gave money to Bangladesh, to Cambodia, to India, to Kenya, in several different places, all these countries. We gave away $254,000 to feed people. So just, Grateful for your generosity. Just want to say that to you. Just, uh, I mean, you, you'll never know till you get in eternity how many people you touched, how many kids you fed, how many families you saved. So, way to go. Let's talk about that really quick. Last week we started in a series that we're going to cover today, and the next week we talked about the lessons we could learn from lockdown. And how many of you know that when we stop and we look back after a crisis, it's important to assess what happened and just say, what did I learn here? There was a test, and did I pass the test? Did I flunk? How many of you know a lot of us flunked? We flunked, right? I mean, those of you who were in line at Costco, what were you in line for? 
Toilet paper, you flunked. Okay, no, we'll keep going. I'm joking with you. Um, I'm joking. But what we did do, we talked last week about uh, two things that were difficult lessons to, to talk about was our bodies. Second, you know, the, the, just the second one was our finances. And those two things are really hard. And some of you are like, why are you talking about physical bodies in church? And 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talked about your body and how important it was as temple of God. And just we covered all that last week. You can get that link and listen to it. But uh, we also talked about finances. And at the end of the service, we did a little survey. And we had a couple thousand of you respond to that. But I'd like to do it one more time really fast. It takes about a minute and a half. So if you've got a phone, you haven't taken the survey, pull out your phone. It's anonymous. We'll never hear from you again about it. I mean, we'll bring it back to you and talk to you about it because it, it, it was the impact of Financial Peace University a couple years ago that we did. And it allowed some of you to fly through the COVID lockdown and actually bless so many other people. And so uh, wanted to get an assessment, kind of a sense of where are we at today as a church. So the, the survey does that. It's totally anonymous. Nobody ever know your answers. So tell the truth. No. Um, here we go. Really fast. You text 818-818, survey to 818-818. And uh, this little survey will come up. Here you go. So, yes, thank you so much for filling this out quickly. Here we go. Number one is how much credit card debt do you estimate that you have? You just hit one of the bubbles and keep going. Number two, how much do you owe on cars? Number three, how much student loan debt do you have? Number four, how much other debt do you currently have? And then number five, about how much do you donate to charitable causes in 2020? Number six, how would you describe your feelings towards your financial situation? Hopeless all the way up to great, very optimistic. Number seven is please answer following. We added these since the last time, is have you taken financial peace? And if so, how was it? And that kind of a thing, have you taken it? But just go ahead and to the next box and then we ask, are you married? And then finally, how old are you? I'm old. You don't even have my box on there. I'm so old. Okay. No, uh, that's... <laughs> so, if you want to do that, if you don't do it right now, you can do it when we get done with service today. Father, we want to come to you and say thank you, God, for generosity. Thank you that you're generous with us. Thank you that our church has been so generous to bless other people around the world, neighborhoods around our church, in our community, in our county. It's all over the place, Father. We're grateful. But God, we want to come to you right now and say, Lord, there's things to learn when we go through crisis. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher today, that you would come and open up your word, open up our hearts. When we get into hard subjects, God, and big mountains to climb, sometimes we just shut down. Pray against shutting down, Father, that we would open up and let you teach us your heart. In the name of Jesus, everybody said... Okay, so this isn't going to be an easy message. I'll just warn you off the front end, and then you'll go, oh, okay, it's going to be hard. No, it's going to, hopefully it'll be good and you'll grow. But last, last week we asked this hard question, like when you go through a test and a trial, and I mean, it's one of the most difficult things any of us have experienced has been the lockdown. And when you go through that, what are you going to do with it at the end of the day? You're going to look back and assess it. Are you going to grow from it? You're just going to, most of us are like, no, rear view mirror, I'm out. You know, I don't want to see that ever again. I don't want to touch it ever again. But, but the truth is, if you're going to grow, you got to assess and understand what happened. And when you're in the middle of a struggle like COVID, you can't do that. I mean, you just can't do it. You just can't get your head in it, your heart in it. But when you get on the other side of it, you need to stop and take an account and say, how did I do? What did I learn? Did I grow? And that, that's just a biblical perspective. That's what we're supposed to do as Jesus followers. Now, if you're here and you're not a Jesus follower, but you're just kind of checking it out, we're, we're glad that you're here. If you're online, we're glad that you're there. If you're on one of our campuses, we're glad you're there. But, but we're going to walk down some stuff that's really focused on people that follow Jesus today. And, and what does that look like? So one of the things that I told you last week was some of the lessons I learned was just how much I miss being with people. How much did you miss being with people? Man, wasn't it hard? I mean, I miss praying with people, eating with people, you know, connecting with people, just being around people. I, I, I miss that. And there were some tough lessons. Oh, we talked about those last week when we talked about, you know, those underlying circumstances. So many of us lost loved ones or we lost friends or we lost coworkers. And there was always those underlying issues, right? And we talked about taking care of ourselves and that one of the lessons we can learn is that we need to do a better job of taking care of ourselves and taking care of our finances and, 
and then we're going to talk next week about connecting with our families. But today we're going to talk about taking care of our spirit. And how, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Deep inside. What, what, what is God trying to do with you inside? That we would be deeper hearted in our faith. Because the truth was, some of us would figure this out, if we really stopped and we used COVID as a wake-up call, we would realize our faith wasn't as deep as we hoped it would be. You know, our, our, our anchor wasn't as set as we hoped it would have been set. That we started to feel pushed around and washed away. And that we needed to take care of our business better. We need to take care of our journey better. And so the reality is today we want to jump into some hard stuff and talk about what does it really look like? What does it really look like to do uh, the journey deeper with God? And how does that look like historically? Because, you know, w- when we talk about our body last week, we're like, whoo, you know, Paul said in, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, our outward person is decaying, but our inward person should be growing. Hello? I mean, I get the outward person decaying because I feel that every day. But is the inward person growing? Because your inward person should always keep growing. You should always, your spirit and your joy with God should keep increasing. Your walk with God should be deeper. Your foundation with God should be stronger. And that, how many of that's hard? I mean, the reality is some of you really rose to the occasion, man. You were out feeding people, serving people, caring for shut-ins. You were generous. You helped other people. But a lot of us, we were freaked out, weren't we? Look at you. Listen, listen. No, no, no. You were freaked out. You were, you were, I mean, we were just like, oh, what happened? What happened? What happened? You know? And what happened was maybe we weren't ready. Maybe we weren't ready inside. You know, the truth is crisis really shows the true character of a Christian. You don't know what's going on in, the, in, your, in your heart with God until you get into crisis. And when you get into crisis, then you find out, oh, I didn't believe as deep as I thought I believed. I, don't, I didn't trust as much as I thought I was trusting. I didn't have the safety with God that I thought I had. And that doesn't happen, friends, until you get into, into crisis. When you get into crisis, you see the real state of how you're doing, how your church family's doing, what, how we're all doing. And, 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 and the truth is that Christians throughout time and history have always been outward in the middle of a crisis. We've always cared for the people around us. And the problem with COVID is we all got what? Inward, we got like shut into our houses and locked in and you got to just protect yourself and stay away from everybody else. And, and, and there's something here that we need to talk about because COVID is really infectious and very dangerous, but kindness is really infectious too. And you can't lose your kindness, friends, in the middle of a, 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 of a COVID pandemic. You can't lose your willingness to reach out and touch other people around you that are struggling and don't have any hope. You can't lose those things because kindness is infectious as well. And there's some realities that we gotta we, we, we got deal with here. There, this is about, this message today is really about eternal perspective. So if you wanna know like what's the outcome, where am I going, I'll tell you, eternal perspective. Uh, how many of you know we talk about that all the time but a lot of times we don't live like that? Hello? That was kind of a question. We don't live like that. We live like, I'm just here, you know, for this life and this moment, and, but, 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 but hold it, hold it. We, I did a funeral yesterday. I did a funeral on Thursday. We had five services here, five memorial services here this week, and I think we had six last week. And the reality is this, the last time I checked, everybody in the room is gonna die a physical death. Man, Pastor Dan, this just got worse. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold, hold it. Isn't that why we go to church? Because we're supposed to, we're trying to get an eternal perspective. That Jesus said, listen, don't fear the person that can kill your body. Fear the one who can control your soul, your spirit. What's going on inside? You were created to be eternal, not temporal. This isn't about the journey here, friends. It's about eternity. This is about getting ready for eternity. Now, the problem with that is, the problem with that is, we're pretty taken up with all the stuff around ourselves, aren't we? Gives us security, gives us safety, makes us, listen, it makes us think we're in control. Did you notice during COVID you felt felt out of control? I mean, a lot of us, we just super felt out of control. We're like, what happened? I mean, panic was like tangible during COVID, wasn't it? Uh, come on, 
You remember when you pulled up the, you pulled up the Costco and the line was around the building? And you're saying to yourself, what is happening? People were panicking, right? So they all got in line to buy what? Toilet paper! <laughs> I mean, that's essential, isn't it? Okay, so, 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 so you look at this and you go, what was going on? Well, there's been people asking questions about that since this has all been taking place. The Pew Foundation did a poll. We talked about a little bit of it last week because tangible things like the love of Jesus are just as real. In this poll, they said that Americans are looking for lessons out of COVID about peace, listen, and stability to help them in troubled times. They use words like empathy, appreciation, working together, and the greater good were all phrases that were echoed over and over in the responses. Whether, and they said that the Christians said these kinds of things, whether they believe that the result of the pandemic is a rapture, an economic collapse, a broken political system, or the death of considerateness, is that a word, considerateness? I think it is, okay. Then the sense, they said, of despair in many people's lives was tangible. They could feel it. And they said, oh, honestly, hopefully the lessons that seem so harsh and heartbreaking at the moment could lead to a better future. That's what most Americans felt. Even though it was really harsh and hard, it could lead to a better future. How many of you know that there's something that Jesus taught all the time, don't lose your hope? Did you hear what I just said? Don't lose your hope. If you're in the middle of a war, don't lose your hope. If you're in the middle of a, a pandemic, don't lose your hope. If you're in the middle of a divorce, don't lose your hope. If you're in the middle of, 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 of a sickness, don't lose your hope because Jesus is your anchor. He's your hope. And if you lose your hope, you lose everything. So let's read some verses together. If you're online, we want to invite you to read with us. We're going to read three different verses today out of 2 Timothy 3, 1, John 16, 33, and Isaiah 41, 10. So let's read loud. Let's read together. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Hello? In the last days there are going to be what? Very difficult times. Not difficult times. There, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. John 16, 33, Jesus speaking. Jesus said this, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And then finally, let's read this one loud and together, Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, <clears throat> those are so great, like, yeah, yeah. Really, did you believe that during COVID? I mean, come on, let's be real. Some of us are like, no, Pastor, I was like in line panicking for some toilet paper at Costco. I'm, I'm playing with you, but, 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 but watch. Walk through these. Second Timothy 3.1. You should know this, Timothy. In the last days would be very difficult times. The last days began with Jesus' resurrection. So if you're wondering, are you living in the last days? The question is absolutely. How, how long are they going to last? I don't know. But I know this. There's going to be very difficult times. The word difficult literally means violent or hard. And it could include violence, that there's going to be really tough things happening. When you get to John 16, listen to Jesus' words. I told you something, in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation. So, 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 hold it. One of those is a may, the other one is a will. In me you may have peace, but in the world you will have struggle, tribulation. And that word tribulation is a really interesting word. It means trouble, distress, and oppression. Anybody feel that during COVID? I mean trouble, distress, and oppression. In the world you will have tribulation, but, 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 in me you may have peace. So hold it, Christians, this is about Jesus followers here. In me you may have peace. So that means that you can be in Jesus and you may not have peace. Is that right or not? So there's a lot of Christians who were in this and they didn't have peace because they didn't press into Jesus. 
You may have peace, but there's no guarantee you will have peace unless you chase after God, unless he's your anchor, unless you press in deep and hard. So it says literally, you may have peace in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I overcame the world. And then finally, Isaiah 41.10, fear not, do not live in fear, do not be afraid because of some promises. And you might say, but God, don't you know our friends were dying? But God, don't you know it was scary? But God, listen, I'm with you. Here's why you shouldn't be afraid, I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. Hold, 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 hold it. Do you know how many dismayed Christians I talked to during COVID? You know what a dismayed Christian is like? <laughs> My life's gone, everything's over. It's horrible, but, 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 but hold it. I'm with you, don't be dismayed. Don't let that overwhelm your spirit because God's greater than everything you're gonna ever face on this planet. I am with you, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Now watch the promises. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you. Oh, really? Yeah, God made you promises. I'm, I'll show up, come to me, I'll show up. I wanna strengthen you, I wanna uphold you, I wanna take care of you. Don't live dismayed, don't live discouraged. But, 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 but the truth is, how'd you do with fear during COVID? No, really, come on. How'd you do with fear? Because some of us just crashed and burned. Many of us lost our peace, we were dismayed, we weren't where we thought we were. Some of us today, some of you are sitting here right now, you're still afraid. You're living in fear. You just, you watched too much TV and didn't read enough Bible. And, and, you, and you didn't listen to what your father was saying. You listened to what everybody else was saying. And what you gotta figure out, listen, the doctors love you. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. I love doctors. Come on, I've had four operations in the last two and a half years. They're my best friends. I mean, I go into Los Angeles, Sunset at Kaiser, and the guy's like, oh, you're back. <laughs> yeah, here I am again, yes. L -l -l Listen, we need doctors, but you need Jesus. You gotta keep this straight, friends. You can't lose your way with God. So let's do some historical things here really quick. Let me walk you through some things talking about, I'm not talking about disregarding your health, but I am talking about living in faith. Because faith and fear don't do well together. We talk about that here often. You know, when your fear level goes up, your faith level usually what? Goes down. And when your faith level goes up, your fear level goes down. Now, it's important to note this. God gave people the ability to be afraid. Is that right? I mean, fear is an asset if it's used properly. It helps you make good decisions. Listen to Paul talking about fear. He says in verse five of chapter seven of 2 Corinthians, for even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, talking about his outward part, but we were afflicted on every side. There were conflicts without and fears within. Hold, 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 hold it. This is a guy who wrote half the Bible, and he just said what? I was what? Afraid, I was afraid, but, 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 but. Now watch this, it's so important you get this part. He didn't stay there. He felt fear and he dealt with it. So he goes on and he says this. How did he deal with it? I was hoping you would ask that. But God, hello? But God, I was afraid. But God, who comforts the depressed, somebody should say amen to that because you have been depressed, okay comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he comforted you and all the things that you did for us. So, 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 hold it, what did he just say? He just said this, I had people around me who helped me. I didn't just live in my fear and isolate myself. I, 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 I had people who cared about me and encouraged me and brought courage back where I was dismayed and discouraged and afraid. I knew I couldn't live in the fear and stay there even though I felt it. Now here's the problem, friends. Some of you felt it, you, you touched it, and then you started hugging it. And it overwhelmed your spirit. You did live dismayed. So, so, so let's talk about difficult days. Let's talk about your faith and what does it look like. 
Because historically there's been, and this is kind of an amazing picture, but there were two major epidemics that took place within 300 years of Jesus' resurrection. So if, if, if you study history and you look at this, you're like, really? Two, yeah, they were gigantic. One of them wiped out somewhere between a quarter and a third of the Roman Empire. Okay, go get your head around that. If a quarter to a third of everybody in the country died, that's what it was like. So some thoughts here. Through the bubonic plague of the 1300s, 200 million people died. The Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, 40 to 50 million people perished. The Asian flu of 1957, 1958, 1.1 million people died. During those times, Christians always rose up and touched other people. They made sitting in the presence of Jesus a priority. Trusting in spite of circumstances became part of their lifestyle. See, what we've done in our culture is we've trusted our circumstances instead of our Savior too much. We look around at the things around us and we think, oh, we're in trouble. No, 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 hold it. What did, what, 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 what did Isaiah 41? Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you. I'm in it with you. That's what, that's what he's basically saying. I'm in it with you all the way. I will not leave you. Over and during tough times, Christians put the news of Jesus, worship, fellowship, prayer as top priorities. They sought the face of Jesus. Now, here's the truth. Some of us were so shocked by COVID, it just blew us up. We'd never experienced anything like this. It was like, whew. is that right or not? I mean, just completely out of your zone, completely out of what you had ever anticipated being in part of your lifestyle. But remember, Timothy, in the last days, there will be difficult times, very difficult times. You can't know what those are gonna look like, but you can know this, there's a God who's crazy about you, and he wants to help you through the journey, but you gotta run to him. So, so, so what did Christians before you do? They ran to God, they sat in his presence, they found hope, and then they helped other people. That's always been what Christians did. During the great plague of the second century, the first one that I, I just referenced has killed so many in the Roman Empire, over five million people died. Some people believe a quarter to a third of the Roman Empire was decimated, but during that blight, Christians rose up and the kingdom of God actually expanded. Jesus' followers cared and loved and helped the sick because they sat in the presence of Jesus, they found hope, and then they sprang into action to give other people hope who were hopeless. Christians of the second century were able to explain the horrible plague as part of a broken world. Now see, what they did is they, they, had an, uh, they, they had an opportunity because most of the people believed in Greek philosophies of gods. And the Greeks would just say the gods are mad at humans and so they're killing everybody. And the Christians said that is not what is happening here. There's sin in the world and people die from that and there's a savior named Jesus and he came to save you from that. And it was an amazing thing because the kingdom of God actually expanded in the midst of this epidemic. But, but, but let's talk about us. The truth was, when the theater closed, the restaurants closed, the gyms closed, the schools closed, we all felt shaken up, didn't we? We felt vulnerable. You know why? Because we thought we were in control and suddenly we weren't. Hello? Control. Let me help you with something. You're not in control. You cannot determine when you're gonna die and leave the planet. The Bible's very clear. There's only one person in control. Unfortunately, we believe that we were in control. Everything in our pattern worked every day, and then suddenly it was gone. When it was gone, it was like, <gasps> We have these huge sense of inadequacy and low productivity and I'm not worthwhile and what am I gonna, it was like uh, our illusions of control and independence were shattered. We became disillusioned. But let me help you with disillusion. You can't get disillusioned unless you're illusioned first. And do you know what it means to be illusioned? 
It means you got snowed. You got tricked. You believe something that was never true. So whenever Christians are dismayed or disillusioned, you need to stop and take an assessment, friends, and say, what was I really trusting in? You were probably trusting in something that wasn't real. And then it was what? Gone. And you were like, oh my, what am I gonna do? Listen, here's what you do. You press back into Jesus. You go back and you realize, I need more help, God. I need more strength, God. I need you to uphold me better, God, and deeper, Father. So, 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 so let's cover this really quick, and we'll press through this fast. But the, the truth is, how did early Christians handle pandemics? It's a great question. It's important to look at. Because when you face a global pandemic like we have been today, how, how have we done in the past? Well, the reality was, like I mentioned to you earlier, when you go through and you think a quarter to a third of your friends or your neighbors or the people around you have died, how would you do with that? And then 100 years later in 251 AD, this first one happened in like 165 AD, the second one happened in 251 AD, the Christians were just a very small minority of people on the planet, but they exerted extraordinary impact on their cultures and their societies because they had hope when nobody else had hope. They believed Romans 828, they took what was horrible, then they turned it into something that was hopeful. They took something that seemed lost and it became life. There is something supernatural that happened in the believers that they became infectious because they had a different perspective than many of us. Now there's a historian, a, a, a sociologist named Rodney Stark, and he wrote a book called In the Rise of Christianity, and it says this about the midst of, of Christians in human calamity. He said the Christian community not only survived, but they thrived, and there was three reasons why they thrived. First, Christians laid their lives down, even unto death, and comforted and cared for those who were dying. They brought solace and hope to the afflicted who were dying of deadly diseases. In doing so, Christians won approval from those who had seen them as a cult or a heresy. Their extraordinary acts of kindness, Christians were then viewed as a caring community and their faith was taken more seriously. So in the midst of death, they imparted life to people and suddenly the light went on for people and instead of the kingdom of God shrinking it away, it expanded under the epidemic. Because people listen when they're afraid are way more open to the good news of the gospel. They're way more open. So, so, so he goes on and he says this. He said the first of these massive epidemics was likely smallpox. During the reign of Marcus Aurelius in 165 to 180 AD is when this took place. And then 100 years later, another destructive epidemic, likely measles, resulted in a massive loss of life throughout the planet. However, the extraordinary response from Christians contributed to an unprecedented growth of the church. While pagan religions and various forms of Greek philosophy provided a means of soliciting and appealing to gods, begging for help, Christians offered a much more satisfactory account of why these terrible times would fall upon society, and they projected, listen, they projected hopeful, even enthusiastic portrait of the future. How can you do that when the people around you are dying? Only if you have an eternal perspective. Only if you realize, listen, there's hope beyond this life. That's what we celebrate at Easter, isn't it? Come on, yes or no? But that's, friends, what we're supposed to live every day. That's supposed to be in us every single day. It's supposed to flow out of us every single day. We're supposed to be hopeful even when everybody else is not. The second thing Stark said, he said Christians were bolstered by their faith. They seemed to endure hardships better than others. Historically, they found that when disaster struck, Christians were better able to cope, and this, re this resulted in substantially higher rates of survival for Christians. This actually meant that in the aftermath of each of these epidemics, the Christian community made up a larger percentage of the population because the pagans died. I'm joking. <laughs> don't, I'm playing with you, just a little bit of, yeah, don't freak out. Listen, the third thing Stark said was this. He said that in such widespread epidemic, large numbers of people that were, did not know Jesus lost the bonds that once gripped them and restrained them for even listening to the gospel. 
Do you hear that, friends? Hope equals survival. And when people are in a crisis, they are desperate for hope. Christians have the good news. It's called the gospel. Jesus died, resurrected from the dead, and ho 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 hold it. I think he said this, John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if they die. I mean, that's a really important statement. And either Jesus is the greatest liar that ever lived, or this is true. This is true, that you don't have to live every day afraid of dying. You've been set free from that. Oh, death, where is your sting? It doesn't mean our hearts don't break when we lose our loved ones, but it means this, we don't grieve without hope. We grieve as people with hope, because we know eternity, and we live with eternity in our hearts. That is the picture. That even though, even though, even though people were dying, Christians were imparting hope to people, and they were listening because they were afraid. How did we do during COVID with sharing our faith with people that were afraid? I don't think we did very good. Some of us may have excelled, but most of us, we were afraid. We allowed our circumstances to rob us of our hope. See, the thing that they actually found, that there was an amazingly high survival rate of Christians that offered evidence this, this group called Christians should be looked at again by the society and the culture. The numbers, this is written by the Cyprian Bishop of Carthage, wrote this from North Africa. In 251, he said the number of conversions that took place was substantial. Even in those early days, they wrote this. This mortality, this death that was happening around them has especially accomplished this for Christians and servants of God, that we have begun gladly to seek martyrdom while we are learning not to be afraid of death. Now, I know you're sitting there, some of you are going, you're kidding me? You're really telling us this should be okay? <laughs> If you have an eternal perspective, I am saying it should be okay. Now, am I calling you to be a martyr? No. That's something that's got to go on between you and God. I don't know what God's calling you to, but I know this. You're not supposed to live afraid. You're supposed to love people, love people, and love people. Stark goes on to say this. While the world is constrained by fear, we take on a different posture. We observe facts and listen to scientists those who are gifted to us by God to make us wise. We then take their analysis, please listen to this, take their analysis and see it through the eyes of our eternal and caring Father. Always framed by hope, he is our platform from which we observe and respond. Now I'm gonna say something to you and I wanna ask you not to write me an email because I've already got some from last night. <laughs> You're not gonna like what I'm probably gonna say right now. But I need to tell you the truth. My opinion, this is Dan's opinion. This isn't the Bible, this is my opinion. During COVID, we allowed something to take place that was unprecedented in the history of the world. A very dangerous thing, in my opinion. We allowed people to die in the hospital without anybody caring for them. And when I was on a phone call with a bunch of leaders in our community, some supervisors, doctors, a bunch of people, and I was invited in this phone call. They said, we're doing an assessment on how the community did in COVID, and we want opinions. And so I listed everybody's opinion, and when it was all done, I said, you know, I pushed a little chat room, I wanna give you my opinion. <laughs> you know, here's my opinion. We really jacked this up really bad. I said, because what we did is we, and I love you doctors, and I said this to the doctors, I love you guys, you're great in helping keep people alive, but you are not trained in caring for people that are dying. That's my job. My job is to care for people when they die. My job is to help people walk from this life into the next life, into eternity. My job is to care for families of people that are dying. 
My job is to care for people that are transitioning from this life to the next life, and you locked us out of the hospital and wouldn't let us do it. For the first time in history, if I'm an adult and I choose to go into a COVID ward to pray for somebody and I die from COVID, that is my problem. I understood that a long time ago. When I signed up and I gave my life to Jesus and was called full time in a ministry, I understood that I might have to give my life up at some point. That historically has been what Christians have done, friends. That's the journey. And that isn't a bad thing, friends. That's a good thing. Your life becomes a sacrifice that brings other people to the kingdom. But the reality in our culture today is that we were locked out. And like I said to the people on the phone call, I said, you have no idea of the devastation you created in families. I got to pick up the pieces of families that sat in the parking lot sobbing because they couldn't hug or love or hold or touch or talk to a loved one while they were dying. This has never happened in the history of the world, and I think it was a gigantic mistake. And I think you need to revisit this when we get on the other side of COVID. I'm not gonna do it right now with you because we're still in it, and I understand I love you guys, you are heroes, you're trying to do the best you can, but I think we made a huge error here. This is a mistake, and it needs to be addressed before we press into another time like this. And so if you disagree, I'm totally okay with that. I love doctors. We have a doctor sitting in the service last night who's in charge of Riverside County's uh, COVID task force. And he actually said, I completely agree with you, Dan. Uh, he wrote me an email at 5 a.m. this morning. We were texting back and forth and he said, I agree with you. I think that we robbed people of life by not letting them walk with their loved ones into eternity. And the truth is, friends, we need to stop right now and say, listen, you need doctors, I need doctors. It's what Stark said, we observe facts, we listen to scientists and doctors, those who are gifted to us by God to make us wise. Then we take their analysis and we go to our Father. And framed by the hope of God, not fear, we press in. So let's close this up. How should you respond? You should pray. Pray about your own part in the journey. You, you should not lose your hope. If you lost your hope, you need to stop. You need to worship, read the word, don't lose hope. Jesus is the God of the future. The last time I checked the end of the book of Revelation, we win the battle. We win. We're supposed to care for other people, friends, no matter what's happening around us. We're supposed to care, it's not about me, even in the midst of death. My life is a sacrifice that's supposed to be given away. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? And if we're Jesus followers, aren't we supposed to do that for other people? And see, friends, you can't do that if you're living in fear. This Bishop of Carthage, he wrote this, and we're done here. He said, the Lord had foretold that these things, these rampaging epidemics they experienced, these things would come to pass. And with the exhortation of his foreseeing word, instructing and teaching, preparing and strengthening the people with his character, the people of his church with his character for all endurance, for everything that was to come, we were prepared. Ephesians 3.16, Paul put it this way. When he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, he said, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit inside your innermost being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, listen to these words, being rooted and grounded or established in love, may have power. So, so, so hold, hold it. If you were living in fear or are living in fear, you need to think this. You need to be deeper rooted and grounded in the love of God. You need to grow, and you have a chance now to revisit the journey and grow but you have to make good choices. Listen to what Paul said. He said that we would be established, rooted, grounded, we would have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses all of our knowledge. When you get touched by the love of God, it empowers you to not be afraid. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or think or imagine, according to this power that's at work inside of us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So what is the calling, friends? The calling is be empowered by Jesus and live in hope. That's the calling, live in hope. No matter what comes against you, what illness, what divorce, what pandemic, what struggle, what death would be around you, don't live in fear, live in hope. Jesus, listen, do not be dismayed. Do not be dismayed. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What does that mean? Listen, it means this. You've got to make choices. You've got to choose hope over confusion and panic. Humility over arrogance. Compassion over self-interest and faith over fear. You've got to choose hope over confusion, humility over arrogance, compassion over self-interest, and faith over fear. For many of us, that means we need to reassess our walk with God. So I want to ask you to stand and bow your heads. I want to ask you, was your faith able to withstand difficult days? Is it healthy enough to stay strong and overflowing in the midst of panic? I don't mean you can't go get toilet paper, because you need toilet paper. Just don't get it in panic. You should be the person in line, smiling at everybody, encouraging them, strengthening them, speaking life over them. Some of you, you don't have people around you. You need to be in a small group. You need to be in school and ministry. Some of you getting rooted and grounded deeper in the word. Some of you, you need deep prayer right now to break fear that you've lived in your whole life. So I want to ask you to just bow your heart before the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit what he's saying to you right now. Father, we come to you and we confess like Paul, often we're afraid. But we also declare we don't want to live in fear. We want to live in hope. We want to believe that you will undergird us, you'll protect us, you'll help us, you'll strengthen us. We would not be dismayed, Father. And I want to ask you if you're here today and you know you're living in fear, slip your hand up so I can pray for you. Good for you. Way to go. Way to go. Don't be afraid. Good for you. Good. Well, there's a lot of us. I'll tell you, let's do this right now. I want to just invite you, come down to the front. Let me pray over you. Don't be afraid to come to the front. Just get out of your chair and walk down here really quick. I want to pray for you. We want to break the spirit of fear. You don't have to live in fear, friends. You need to live in faith. So just slip out quickly and come down here. Let me pray for you. You know, every time I went into surgery the last couple of years, every time I close my eyes, I think this, well, I may wake them up, I may wake up in, in Jesus' presence, you know. The next face I might see might not be the doctor, it might be Jesus, right? And you just gotta be okay with that. You gotta be able to smile at that. You gotta be able to say, God has blessed my life. I don't wanna live a life that was woulda, coulda, or shoulda. I wanna live a life that excels in hope. I want to live a life that says, God, you're greater than my insecurities and my fears. I want to live a life of joy in the midst of struggle. I don't want to just be afraid. I want to give life to the people around me. God can do this. He's so good at this, friends. He's so good at this. He can do this in each of us. Oh, Father, we come to you as brothers and sisters right now just saying, help us, oh Lord. We're in difficult times. 
some of us have not had peace, Lord. We've had tribulation. But you said, take heart, because you've overcome the world. And so we come to you this morning and we just say, God, touch our hearts. As Paul prayed in our innermost being, let there be life, the power of resurrection. Holy Spirit, your touch in our lives. You told us to fear not, for you are with us. So God, we pray for changed thinking, that we would think eternally. We wouldn't think about five minutes from now or 10 minutes from now, but we would, we would start thinking different. We would start thinking your thoughts, that you created us to live forever, and that you wanna protect that, guard that, and let that life, that eternal life, explode inside of each of us. And so, Father, we confess to you we're afraid, and our fear robs us from your thoughts. So we're grateful, God, for fear. When it's in small doses, it helps us. In large doses, it paralyzes us. And so we come to you right now, Father, and we say we want you to break the spirit of fear in us and release the spirit of faith. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to brood over each life here as you brood over the waters, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2, that you brought life when you stirred the water. And so we ask for you to brood over each heart here, each life, each circumstance, that you would hover over them, as it were, and rest on them, God. And you would birth new life in them, Father, where there's fear. Faith would start to rise up. That they would make wise choices, God. Humble choices, Father. They would say, I need help. I need friends. I need a small group. I need the school of ministry. I need to be rooted and grounded deeper. So, Lord, we pray for wise choices. We pray for deep transformation in their soul. We thank you, God, that we all, we all deal with fear, but we thank you, God, that you have overcome the world. And we know this, in last days there'll be difficult times, but nothing that you can't overcome in us. So we thank you, God. We thank you, God, we thank you, God, that you have what we need today. Move in each life, each circumstance, and each heart with supernatural power, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. You did the right thing. You're starting the right way. But listen, you got to press in. You got to press in. You got to press in. It's a daily deal. So let me ask you a question. How many of you remember during COVID, I wrote devotions every day for weeks and weeks and weeks? Why did I write devotions every day? Because I was trying to do what I'm asking you to grow into. I'm trying to encourage you. I was trying to give you hope and impart life to you so you could get through the battle and the struggle. Now li listen, I am you. You gotta think like that. The only difference is I just kept growing deeper with God. I mean, funny story, we'll go home, the guy standing right here, he confronted me on the steps of Sweeten Hall over on Hellman Avenue when I was coming to church after being out partying all night long, and I was 21 or 22 years old, staggering up the steps after drinking the night before, a young Christian, still trying to figure out the journey, and he looked me in the face and he said, dude, when are you gonna surrender to God and decide to grow? And you know what? You know what I said? I said, get out of my life, dude. <laughs> and then it took God breaking me down for four more years where he actually got in the car and drove to North Idaho and ministered to me, him and his wife. And four more years later, with my heart all broken down, I yielded. And I said, I yield, God. I give up. I want your way no matter what. I want your way. Listen, you can do this by the grace of God. You can yield to Jesus and find hope where you don't have to be afraid. Amen? I love you. You guys are amazing. Way to go. God bless you. If you want prayer, stay up here, and we'll have a team of people up here to pray for you individually. God bless you. Have a great day today.
Well, what a powerful message that we heard today. We hope it's been a blessing for you. Before you go, maybe jump into the chat and share what's one thing that you learned about the message today. Maybe each one of us can learn from each other. So make sure you jump in the chat, share with us one thing that maybe you learned today from the message. And I know for me, my heart, our heart here at Water of Life is not for you to just take in words and to take in information, but we want it to be transformation, not information. And the Holy Spirit wants to continue to transform us, right? We're not supposed to just listen to the message and continue on with our life, but, but God calls us to be transformed by his word. And so maybe throughout the week, Take some notes, journal on what the things that you've learned on throughout the week, and maybe God wants to continue to speak to you as we've learned from our time today. And so maybe even right now, pull out your phone, your notes, or maybe you journal. Write a couple thoughts. What are some things that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now? And continue to do that throughout the week. I want to challenge you if you want to grab your journal or grab your notes on your phone and journal on the ways that God has been speaking to you from this message. And so as we close our time together, just as a reminder, we're here for you. We would love to pray for you. We have pastors online who would love to pray for you. So make sure you message us or you can always call us at our offices. And so before we leave, I want to pray for us. And so God, we just thank you for this time together, for, for worship and for the word and the way that you've spoken to us. And God, would it not just be information, but would it be transformation in our hearts, God? And so Holy Spirit, continue to speak to us. We long to hear from you. And so as we go throughout our week, God, that we would be uh, sensitive to your spirit, that we would continue to encounter your presence. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, hey, God bless. We love you guys and we'll see you next weekend.